very much for inviting me to come and talk to you all today about Certify. I'm hoping that you've already seen a little bit of information about this, but I'm going to start from the very basics so that we're uh, we're all going through at the same at the same pace. So my name's Hannah. I work at CERN. I'm here at CERN. Everything at CERN is blue, including the wall behind me. So uh, just to give you some idea, I'm I'm currently in Switzerland, so it's uh, um it's very cold. And uh, I forgot my jumper, so it's going to be an interesting hour sat here talking with you guys. But yeah, um, so I, I work on the computer security team, and I'm also uh, involved with the efforts that we're doing to interact with identity federations. So thanks very much to Mark from JISC and uh, to Anne Harding from Jeon and various other people who work on the ARC project, which is the project that I'm, I'm currently working in and is funding some of this work. So we're going to talk very briefly about what security incident response looks like in a federated scenario first, or with federated identity, and then I'll give an introduction into what is Certify, why it's important, and then what do you, what do you all need to do, or if this is something that interests you, and where to look next. There's a lot of other information out there, and I think we're, we're fairly Googleable now, which is good. So uh, take a look around. There's lots of interesting material. So starting with, with the basics. So I want us to do a little bit of a thought experiment. So what if an incident spread throughout the entire federated research and education community via a single compromised identity? And this is effectively the scenario that, that we're being presented with, with identity federations. Uh, this is the map from EDUGAIN showing the different member, uh, member federations in their countries and effectively a single identity from one of the identity providers in EDUGAIN grants you access, with some, uh, with some caveats there, to a very large number of services. So in terms of numbers, I've got this little box here down in the, the bottom right corner. So this was the numbers from, from December. We have over 2,000 identity providers. And for us, thinking in a security mindset, this is potential sources of compromised identities. And then we have almost 2,000 services. So this is places that could be, could be accessed by those compromised identities. So thinking back to this, this scenario where we have a security incident affecting multiple people within the Federation, how could we actually determine the scale of the incident? How can we work out how far those, those compromised identities have actually been able to penetrate the, um, the entire ecosystem, as it were? Are there logs and could they be shared? Do they contain the useful information that we need? Do they have timestamps? Do they have unique identifiers? Can we work out exactly how far an incident spread? And then secondly, who should actually take responsibility for resolving the incident? It's not immediately obvious. So we're in, uh, we're in this environment where we each, so myself as CERN, you as your university, or whichever organization you're representing, you're a very small piece of a very large puzzle. Um, EDUGAIN itself maybe shares some role in, in understanding the scope of an incident, maybe your, your federation operators, um, but at some level the responsibility is shared and how do we deal with that? How are we actually able to alert the different identity providers and the service providers who are involved in an incident? And then once we're alerting people and sharing information, can we ensure that that information is shared confidentially? and that the reputations of all the different organizations involved in an incident are protected. So those are the questions that we're trying to, trying to deal with in Certify. So the problem. Although decentralized systems generally do mitigate the impact of incidents, it's still clearly an inviting vector of attack, and it's maybe something that's not been thought about so much. As EDUGAIN itself is invisible to campuses, services, and users, there's no central collaboration infrastructure. It's really just a skeleton service to allow your members in the UK Federation to interact with people outside. The, the issue of security incident response in federations is, is as applicable on an individual federation level as it is in the, in the context of EDUGAIN. It's just slightly more simple. So we would need participants to collaborate during incident response. And this might be outside their remit. It might not be their job. They might not be paid for it. 
So how do we get people to agree in advance that they will dedicate the time and the effort that's needed to actually resolve those incidents when they happen? So we have a little schematic down the bottom here just showing a couple of federations and how they, how they potentially interact. And then our, our little baddie in the corner thinking about different ways that um, he or she could exploit that. And it, it does seem like common sense when you think about it. People should, people should be rational, they should be helpful and work together to resolve these incidents. So if we have a service provider and as an example, they notice suspicious activity from a handful of users at a specific IDP, then they maybe notify that IDP who identifies several more compromised identities, perhaps their entire identity management system is compromised and people are able to create identities on the fly, then the IDP would hopefully identify all the different services that those identities have accessed, notify them and then together the different organisations are able to work towards resolving the incident, suspending those accounts and doing any, uh, any follow up that's required. In reality, it doesn't quite work like that. So I'll come on in a little while to, um, to what we've been doing at CERN in the past and some of the similarities to uh, the scenarios that we're facing in, in identity federations. And these are just some examples from what we've seen in the work that we're doing in the security team. So maybe a service doesn't share the details of the compromise because they're concerned about their, their reputation. That could be one thing. Perhaps a smaller identity provider is not actually able to suspend the users or to trace their usage. Um, maybe their the logs are insufficient. And then maybe the services that that identity provider then contacts are not bound to abide by any confidentiality protocols and they disclose sensitive information to the press, to the wider community, to whoever it may be. And then the, the killer really, who do you contact? there are no security contact details. This was not something that was built into the, into the original SAML spec and, and the, different, um, the different specifications that have been, been devised by the community are beginning to put those into place, but it's not, it's not a standard. So hopefully you're beginning to see that there is some extra thought required to deal with security incidents in, in a federated scenario. So we have this new vector of attack and we don't actually know the security capability of all of the participants and this has led to some degree of lack of trust in using Edugain and using identity federations by certain organisations who are maybe used to working in a more controlled environment where they know the security capability of their participants for example. Being realistic security incidents are inevitable, attacks are inevitable, that's going to happen, we need to accept that. But we can make the security capability of the participants in identity federations transparent and build those relationships up between the people and the organisations. So what myself and various other people, including many people from the UK Federation, have been doing over the last couple of years is to define a trust framework called Certify. So a brief pit stop, just to give you some context about why on earth I should be talking to you about this, why is someone from CERN this interested in the topic. So we run a grid infrastructure. Um, there are many physicists from the UK who use our grid infrastructure to do their computing for particle physics, data analysis and storage. And traditionally, these users have an X509 certificate for authentication and then proxies for authorization. This uh, way of working is very well defined and controlled um, through security policies. We have a very strong trust set up with the, um, the IGTF. I don't want to go into so many details there, but what we're planning to do and hoping to do, along with many other research communities, is to rely more on identity federations. It gives a much smoother experience for the user. It's more scalable. Um, and we want, our, we want our scientists to be able to do that but we need the identity federations to provide an equivalent level of assurance um, an equivalent level of trust for us to enable those SAML identities or whatever they may be in the future to use our infrastructure in the same way. So we've been one of the many organisations that participated in defining 
the specified trust framework. So we've talked a lot about federated security incident response. Um, and I've mentioned certify several times, but I haven't actually said what it is yet. So certify is this trust framework which seeks to solve some of the problems that we just talked about. It has had a lot of input from different places. It's something that's been fairly well thought through by the community, including the art project where I'm working at the moment, which is funded by the European Commission. RefEDS, where I imagine some of you participate quite actively. Géant, so the, the European networking organization. FIM4R, which is a fairly informal network of different research communities who are coming up with, with joint requirements they have for identity federations, one of them being we would like to understand better how we'll work together in security instance. And, uh, and generally from the wider community, I know several people in the UK Federation who are very active in the working group that we have, which has defined Certify and is now pushing it a little bit further to see how we, where we go from here. It's still very much open, so if this is a topic that interests you, please send me an email afterwards. You can get involved. It would be good to have more, more input. So Certify itself stands for the Security Incident Response Trust Framework for Federated Identity. You can take a look at the document itself. It's fairly short. It's a list of 16 assertions, effectively. So it's a, it doesn't take a huge amount of time to go through it. There are plenty of links throughout this PowerPoint, and um, I'm sure Mark and myself can share some afterwards as well for those who are interested. And what it does is it breaks down um, effectively different capabilities that you would expect from an organization operating with good security practices. So we have operational security. Um, the, the framework is requiring that there is a security incident response capability and that it has sufficient authority to mitigate, contain the spread of, and remediate the effects of an incident. So fairly generic. Um, hopefully you're reading this and thinking, yeah, that sounds, that sounds reasonable. My organization, I think we do that. And then on to incident response. We want to assure the confidentiality of the information that's exchanged during response. Identify those contacts, so really get the emails, get the names, and then guarantee a response during collaboration. This doesn't have to be 24 seven, it can be best effort, but as long as people are prepared to respond as soon as they are able to. Traceability, improving the usefulness of logs. Do they have those timestamps? Do they have identifiers? and then ensuring that they're kept in accordance with policy. And the last section in Certify is participant responsibilities and just confirming that the end users are aware of an appropriate AUP. Do they know what they're allowed to be doing on the system? Um, and, and do we know what is, what is considered out of bounds for them? So the current adoption of this framework, we, uh, we published the framework version one a year ago, almost to the day, I believe. Um, and we currently have about 197 organizations who uh, will identity providers. So this is typically universities, research institutes. Um, so they are saying, yes, as an identity provider, we conform to the certify framework. The identities coming from us are covered by a security incident response capability. On the other side, we have 26 services who are saying, yes, we, we conform to the Certify Framework. Um, any identities accessing here um, can expect to be entering an environment that has the security incident response capability itself. And there are 18 federations, including the UK Federation, that support the adoption of Certify. And it's growing at, at a reasonable rate, and you can see that the, the coverage is fairly global. In the UK in particular, I just took a, a, list through, a look through the list the other day. So we've got EMBL, Newcastle University, Loughborough University, NERC, SDFC, Uni Days, University of Glasgow. And there are several of these organizations who've been directly involved in defining the framework as well. So a very strong representation from the UK. And why is Certify important? Why, why should you be sat here listening to this? Why should anyone care? 
I want to give a few examples, and maybe we'll start with one example here of a, a credential dump. So our, our little person in the corner discovers a credential dump online containing identities from, from identity providers and thinks, what should I do with this? And I consider the impact, um, maybe it's username, passwords, whatever it is, and then think, okay, a compromised identity could impact the whole community. And they decide to share that intelligence with the community. So by listing a security contact for your identity provider, you enable intelligence sharing. And this is not just a, an abstract example. So today after lunch, some of my colleagues are going to be sending out advisories to various other um, so various partners that we work with, including universities, other organizations, because we, it's something that we, we invest time in going through these password dumps and saying, okay, yeah, it's worthwhile for the community to let people know. So I think the dump that they're, they're planning to send information on this afternoon was something like 2.6 million username password pairs. Um, and these, these are really things that affect the community. So listing that security contact for your identity provider, you, you're enabling intelligence sharing to some degree. Of course, this is not something that's expected from every participant, uh, everybody who conforms to the Certify Framework, but um, there are people out there who are, who are doing this work and who are working on behalf of the community in general. A second example here, so we have somebody who discovers that their service provider has been compromised and is maybe hosting advertising or perhaps there's been a data breach, who knows, and thinks, okay, anyone who has accessed this service could be affected. They identify the users that have connected and they, they find those IDs, they find the, the IDPs. And then from the metadata, the, the Federation metadata, they can get the security contact that they need to, to talk with and they can then inform that, those people through their security contact. So by using Certify, you're part of a community that's, that's really working to protect research and education users. A third example here. So another service provider operator discovers some suspicious file deletion at their service and attributes it to a, a federated user. Links, okay, maybe this user's malicious, maybe their identity is compromised. We need, to, we need to dig a little deeper. They're able to contain the situation locally um, and suspend that user on a, on a local level, but what if the problem is bigger? So they would then seek assistance from the identity provider and maybe ask some of their other compromised identities, really let them know that that user has been, been performing suspicious activity. And this is, this is a key point here. So as an identity provider, your knowledge is essential for understanding the scope of an incident. But on the other hand, it's typically the services who notice the incidents first. So it's really these, these two bodies acting together, the service and the identity provider who are able to resolve the incident. So what are the benefits? So identity providers, you, you advertise that your users are covered by incident response at their own organization. And then on the service side, you advertise that your service is trustworthy and covered by an instant response capability. And together, we can guarantee an efficient and effective response from partner organizations during instant response. And we make all our systems safer together globally in trying to, to raise the bar um, or uncover the bar in operational security in identity federations and, and educate. So what do I need to do next? Time. So it's fairly simple. We have a wiki online, so you can you can take a look there. And effectively, it's just two steps. You assess your security practices. You complete a self-assessment of the Certify framework. And I, oh, sorry, identify a trusted security contact. And then the second step is to include two metadata extensions. So one to say that you support the Certify framework and one to include the security contacts in your metadata. Um, you don't actually need to do this yourself. I'll, I'll come on to that later. But just so you know un, under the hood how these things are expressed. So expressing compliance 
Um, this is just done by the standard OASIS Assurance Pass specification. For I don't know quite how, how technical the audience is here, but for, for your interest, effectively. And the Certify Assurance Profile is recognized by IANA. So we can just add that in to the metadata. Uh, you can see here in the middle. Oops. We're back. So it's a profile that's, that's registered under RefEDS. The next bit here is the security contact. And I'd just like to take a few minutes to, uh, to explain to you the expectations of the security contact. So the fra from the framework itself, the requirements say that the, the security contact must use and respect the traffic light protocol during all instant response correspondence. I have another slide on this in a second, boring up if this is something that's completely new to you. Promptly acknowledge receipt of a security instant re report, and then as soon as circumstances allow, investigate incident reports regarding resources, services, or identities for which they're responsible. The, the certified contact should be the primary point of contact during incident response, and it's, it's expected that secondary uh, contacts will be involved as necessary. So it could, it could be your service desk, it could be uh, maybe you have a computer security officer, a generic email address, whatever makes more sense for your organization. The traffic light protocol. So this is a very well used protocol um, which defines if you're sending information to somebody, it defines when the information should be used and how it can be reshared. So starting with the we'll start at the bottom of the table here with white. So um, if you send if I send some information to you saying TLP white, this implies that the information I'm sharing has minimal or no risk and you as the recipient may share it however you like. If it's green, um, it means the information is useful to be shared. Maybe there's a very small amount of risk and you can share it with peers or partners but not post it on Twitter or whatever might be considered publicly sharing. Amber is now getting a little bit more serious. There could be a risk to reputation or privacy if that information is disclosed very widely. And so you're only allowed to share it with members of your own organization or other groups that, that I could stipulate. So I say TLP Amber, um, but you could share it with your customers, for example. And then TLP Red, this could really lead to reputational or privacy damage if it's shared widely, and so you can't share it with anybody. So this is the protocol that's used to respect confidentiality. It's very widely used in security circles. Um, I imagine in the identity space, this is not quite so widely known. But if you're, if you're in contact with any security people at your organization, if that's a university or whatever it might be, then this is likely something that they've already heard of. So who should you be choosing as your security contact? Um, so we put together this little flow chart here. If you're, if you're stuck or needing some inspiration, so you start, and start at the top, say, actually, is my organization certified compliant? And once it is, you maybe ask yourself the question, are we covered already by an external instant response team? Is there, is there a team at the university or at the research institute or wherever you may be who already take responsibility for this? If it's yes, then perhaps it makes sense for them to cover the security instant response that involves federated identities as long as that's something they agree to and they understand the impact of working in a federated identity um, environment. If there's not a team like that that exists, maybe there's a computer security team um, internal to do whatever it is that you, where you're working. Um, do they have sufficient knowledge to support certify? Or potentially, it might be down to the, to the entity operator, so the, the identity provider or the service provider who could fulfill the certify requirements um, for your organization. Do they have the security knowledge? Um, if not, then maybe you need to be improving security practices um, for the federated part of your, your organization. But it might make sense for it to be either somebody external. I should, I should have clarified here, this could really be somebody who has um, nothing to do with your organization. So, for example, in the Netherlands, 
um, at a national level they have a computer emergency response team who is able to to perform these tasks for for multiple universities so for them it makes a lot of sense to put that particular contact maybe that's something that that makes sense for your organization so someone external somebody within the organization or maybe the person really running your idp or fp So which information do you need to include about that, that security contact? The only things mandatory are the given name and email address. You can add telephone numbers, additional email addresses, whatever else, if you, if you would like to, if you think it helps to build trust. So for example, at CERN, we have one particular individual who's fairly well known in the security circles. So we put both the generic computer security email address and his individual one. And you can see here the extension that goes into metadata to do that. So we're coming to the end. I think I'm very under time. So hopefully there are questions. And where can I look next? So we have a home page. The, the link's just at the bottom here, so take a look. And this is where you can really access the framework and, and look further, take that back to your team and say, OK, is this something we comply with? Or do we need to change things? There are some frequently asked questions. If you have questions, please let me know. Um, and if it's something that other people have asked, I will really stick them onto the frequently asked questions page here. Hi, Hannah. We, we do certainly have a question. Um, what do you think the impact of GDPR will be on it? So it's quite interesting. Um, and maybe I flip the question on its head. So GDPR, uh, the work that's going on in the community, is hoping to actually use Certify as a way to enable uh, data sharing as part of generic attribute flow. So there are people in the, the Géant project and various other places who are building up a framework to, um, to enable attribute flow. And one of the, so this is not my specialist subject, so uh, please forgive me if I'm stumbling slightly. One of the aspects of GDPR is that if there's a data breach, you have to let people know, even if they're not part of your organization. And what the, the way the community is moving is to use Certify to get those security contacts and in that way enable the data breach uh, notification to go out to people in the community. In terms of sharing logs and GDPR, as far as myself and my colleagues have understood, if it's well justified, um, and there's legitimate interest for sharing of security information, then it seems to be okay. I mean, I'm not a lawyer. People will probably argue with this. Um, but there's this, there is this strong idea of legitimate interest being a reasonable reason to share information. Okay, thanks Does for that. that. Partially answer it at least. Okay. okay. Um, so we'll just stay for a little while to see if any more questions come in. Mm -hmm. um, I was just going to add a, a, another element, which is obviously um, publishers in particular keep coming to all the federations, talking about federated access, its relevance in the modern, in the current world, um, security of resources when we talk about things like um, Sci-Hub, etc. And you know, this is another one of those tools, but it increases the confidence on all sides that we can deal with security issues. So, it, you know, it, it's certainly something that um, all federations, you know, are, are very, very keen to encourage because um, we, we need to maintain that trust and confidence between federations, um, institutions, and, and particularly, I, I'm thinking about, you know, academic um, journal providers beyond the sort of high science area you're talking about, Hannah. Yeah. Um, Cab, I, I was just going to bring Reese in if, if Reese has got any comments. Um, no, the only thing I was going to say was the other um, question was around the existing C-cert stuff that uh, is in the UK Federation. Uh, well, not in the UK Federation, across JISC. Um, how, it, how all of this relates to that is this is specifically around federated security incidents, but obviously that's kind of a subset of general C-cert work. So how it relates at the organization level is at many, many of our membership, many of JISC membership universities and colleges and whatever will have security uh, teams and little uh, um, uh, C-cert, we'll have links to JISC C-cert 
those may well be the right people to be the security contacts at an institution. That's where this might hook up. Um, so the security teams within institutions may already be doing all of the stuff. Well, you would hope are already doing almost all of the stuff that Certify requires. Anywhere, anywhere big who's got a grip on security stuff will be doing most of this um, and will have contacts with CSERT. So, yeah, they are prime candidates for this kind of thing, but um, for being the security contacts of Certify. But uh, it may be, it may not be the case in some institutions. You may want it to be specifically the team who looks up the federated access stuff who can then consult the security team. It, it's entirely an organizational choice. Yeah. Absolutely. I have, um, so there is a training course as well. Um, it effectively goes through in a little bit more detail the things that we've talked about today. So if you, if you need to go and share this information with other people, there's some more information on security contacts and some more links and things. So take a look at this. It's quite a nice resource for people to, to go a bit further. Yep. And then um, practically, if anyone wants to, uh, do this. Oh, your next slide. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Practically, if anyone is interested in doing this, because I think it is really something that everyone should be moving towards doing, especially with uh, as the question we had around uh, GDPR um, rears its ugly head, and everyone has to be a lot more conscious around this kind of thing. This is a tool to help um, meet, uh, you know, all the new GDPR requirements that everyone has. Um, there's a, uh, as Hannah's talked about, you know, there's a self-assessment thing uh, where you go and see how well your organization meets all these requirements. If you think you do, it's just a, uh, an assertion you make to us. And that page that Hannah's got on the slide on the UK Federation's website uh, gives more detail. So you need to give us a few bits of information like certified contact, either security contact and whatnot, and one or two other little bits and pieces. But generally, uh, it boils down to you telling us that you're ready to do certify and we add that little flag to your entity in the metadata and uh, everyone's happy. Um, Mark, anything else to say? Uh, if you have any other questions around this, the UK Federation Help Desk are uh, perfectly willing to uh, answer any questions, but most of the information you will ask about is already on that web page shown, I think. Okay, thanks, Reese. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Reese. Um, I say email us if any questions and we'll distribute um, an email very soon giving a link to the full recording and also um, to the various resources we have sort of signposted to everybody. And I think um, Hannah, as you said, this is an ongoing thing, isn't it? So people really still, you know, have the opportunity to get involved. Yeah, no, absolutely, especially in relation to GDPR. That was a, a good question to bring up. So thanks very much, because yep. it's it's becoming very relevant um, for data protection and, and other things. So there will be much more much more work ongoing. So, yeah. Yep. Um, and in terms of um, people doing this, um, the in the institutions, Hannah put it on the slide, were kind of some of the early adopters of this. Well, some of those were kind of early adopters because they were involved in setting up, but we are starting to get more people who weren't involved in it to join up. So one of the people missing from your slide, Hannah, was Cardiff University, who signed up last week or the week before. Um, um, so now is the time, basically, where kind of the piloting period is over and a time to actually just get, get yourself signed up to this and uh, so we can actually start using it in in for real incidents. 